Today, we'll talk about CM3, which is a model that directly ingests websites, learns the HTML. It uses a novel objective that does left to right language modeling, but with a twist that essentially allows it to incorporate bidirectional information into the language modeling. It incorporates text, structure, images, hyperlinks, and with clever prompting, it can do almost anything. It can do what Dali does, generating images from text. It can caption images. It can do text summarization. It can do entity linking, and it can do much more. I like this paper because of the idea of incorporating the structure of HTML. And also the new objective is very cool. So we're briefly going to go over what the paper is and does and how it works. And then we're going to jump into an interview with Armin, who joined me in talking about this paper is a very informative interview. And I suggest that uh, you give it a listen. So this is just going to be a short introduction. Again, I have to rely on you to tell me how I make the best use use of authors coming on because I think it's so cool. I want to talk to them about the paper and I want to get the most information out there for you that is possible. So please tell me short intros, long intros, how to structure it and all. Leave a comment down. Uh, if you like videos like this, leave a like as well. Um, if you leave a dislike, you know, that's kind of useless now on YouTube, but you know, feel free. I'm still going to see it. Um, so CM3, a causal masked multimodal model of the internet by researchers at Meta, I'm going to guess this is now. So this model is it's a family of models, actually, and a family of causally masked generative models trained over a large corpus of structured multimodal documents that can contain both text and image tokens, in fact, much more. So what this model does, it's a language model, and the language model ingests HTML, a cleaned up version of HTML, but still HTML. If you don't know what HTML is, HTML is essentially the language your websites are written in, and it consists of tags. So for example, one tag is a div tag, that is, it's, it, it has, it had, I think it had a meaning at some point. But right now, it just serves as kind of a container tag. So div might be something like a container and you close it by saying slash div. Anything in between is the content of that div. Other popular elements are, for example, a paragraph. So inside a paragraph, you can have some text. Hello there. And then what you can also have is hyperlinks. So hyperlinks start with an A tag. So you can see these tags can be nested. These tags can have attributes. So the A tag can have an attribute like an href. So that is a URL. So www something and so on. So it can have URLs. It can also have URLs within the document. Then there is the text of the link. Now we close the A tag. Oops. <laughs> then we may continue the paragraph or we may close the paragraph, a forward slash. And the last thing that we're also going to need in these documents right here are images. So there can also be images and I'm going to, I'm going to write this over here. After all, white space doesn't matter in HTML. So images can have a so called source, the two most important attributes are the source, and the source is it's usually usually it's a URL, it can be a base 64 blob. But usually it's also a URL, like, uh, I don't know, like imger com slash something something dot JPEG. So the browser would actually go and fetch that image and display it at this position. And also, an important thing is the alt text, which you put there for screen readers and, and other sort of um, assistive technology that cannot directly make use of the image to see what's in the image. So you can already see here that there's a lot of information in HTML. Now previous work, what they would have done is if it's a language model, for example, GPT three, they would simply only take the text bits of that, they would take, for example, here, hello, there, they would probably also take the text of the link right here. And and that would be it, they would scrape the websites for the containing text to do language modeling, other models such as Dali, Dali, I've made a video about Dali, if you don't know what it is, but essentially a model that you put in uh, text, and it gives you an image. And the reverse of that is is sort of clip, 
not the reverse, but clip is a model where that says whether or not an image or a piece of text go together well. And the reverse of Dali would be like a captioning model. You put in an image and you get a text describing that. All of that you can get by also scraping the internet and always taking the following two things. You take the alt text of a, an image tag and you take that source image. And these are pairs of images and text that go together, right? So you can train, this is kind of like weak supervision. There are some problems with that, but it's weak supervision. Uh, likewise, there are other tasks. If you are, for example, doing entity linking or, or entity, um, entity disambiguation or something, what you would do is you would go to Wikipedia. And on Wikipedia, you would always take the text of a link and the link itself if it points to another Wikipedia article. And you know, in this case here, it says like, Romans were captured by Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great would be a thing you could click on. And then that link would sort of tell you what entity that is, it would lead to the Wikipedia page of Alexander the Great. So people have parsed websites for a long time, in various ways to achieve different tasks to collect data for different tasks. However, there is this new direction. And it's not the first paper that does this, but it is the first that I've come across. And the previous work is also by uh, largely the same authors. So I'm just going to give them credit uh, for some at least some of this. The 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 novel idea here is that why don't we use the entire structure of HTML directly in instead of just scraping subset of them. Now again, they do clean the HTML because a lot of HTML is kind of like visual elements, uh, cascading style sheets and so on, there definitely would be information there. But it is a good step to say, hey, the whole thing, you know, the entire thing here, the structure that is actually super duper important, it has so much structure that we would throw away. Otherwise, for example, the image right here, you know, it could be not only described by the alt text, it could also be described by like the surrounding text like this stuff right here. Of course, if there's an image on a website, reasonable to assume that the surrounding text might also have to do something with it, right? Um, it is reasonable to assume that in order to disambiguate this entity right here, uh, you might want to take a look at the text around it, you might want to take a look at the images around it, and so on. So if we had a model that could directly learn the structure of HTML, we could exploit all the work that went into creating that HTML, which is essentially what front end programmers and, and website programmers do all day. This is human ingenuity that goes into creating these structures, even if it's a framework, right, that there is something someone that has to come up with, you know, what are the elements? How is the structure? And that is that is really good data. And exploiting that data to me when I saw this, it made perfect sense to say, you know, we should just keep the HTML and just learn the language model over the HTML. Right? So what can you do if you have such a language model? Well, if I have trained such a language model, I can maybe, you know, start a paragraph, I start a paragraph, I put like a piece of text right here. All right. Um, and then I just start an image tag. And I say source equals, and then I let the model generate whatever is here, right? Now, there is a there is a there is a trick right here, I can't obviously put a URL, I actually have to put the image itself there. But if the model is good enough, it will look at this, it will generate an appropriate image. Or, you know, if I, I could do the same thing by simply having an image tag, and first generating the alt first putting the alt text, I put something here that I want, and then source, and I say equals, and then I let the model continue, it will generate me an image, I can reverse that I can put the image first, and then say, please generate me the alt text, I can put an entity and say, please generate me the link to the entity, and so on. So you can see how powerful this is. Uh, we can do many, many different tasks if we have a model like this. The this is one thing that this paper does. Um, and I said, it's inspired by previous work. However, uh, it, it pushes it a bit further. Um, so first, we have to discuss this, and then we have to discuss the novel objective, which makes it even more powerful. So the only thing to discuss right here, actually, is how 
do they treat images? Because language modeling is fine. I can just have an appropriate tokenizer for HTML, which needs to be, I guess, a little bit of a different tokenizer than for uh, regular text, because you have to handle these tags correctly. Uh, but essentially, I have to have a tokenizer and transformers are pretty good at learning to to open uh, sort of appropriate tags and, and then close appropriate tags again and so on. The only part really are the images. So we don't want to we don't want to have URLs of images in there. Instead, what they do whenever they encounter an image tag. So whenever they encounter image with a source uh, that equals some URL www dot something, um, what they do is they would go they would fetch that image, they would put it through a, I think a, a VQ GAN model, some vector, some vector quantized uh, GAN model that is pre trained. Uh, they would extract the latent, uh, the latent Z, the latent embedding, uh, the yeah, the latent embedding from that, and they would put that embedding here. So these models, these vector quantized models, they would take some image and have like a neural network, and they would encode that into a series of tokens, which are going to be something like, I believe it results in 256 tokens, latent tokens. So these are essentially because it's vector quantized. Every one of these is a uh, part of a vocabulary. And so these are essentially tokens like language model tokens like letters that I can build images from, I can simply unroll, whoops, I can simply unroll the tokens in these images that the VQ GAN gives me, right, I can have some scheme of how I go through here. And I can replace the source property here, just with the M with these tokens, or I mean, appropriately, the embeddings of these tokens. All right, uh, this and this goes here, and so on. So once I have these tokens, right, I can train the language model, and then the language model will generate these tokens again, again, they're not image, they're not continuous values, because it's a vector quantized model, they come from a fixed vocabulary. And that's what I ingest. And that's what I predict. And therefore, I can treat it exactly the same as the language model, there is a bit of a difference with how these things are distributed. They do talk about this in the paper as language tokens are Zipfian distributed and image tokens are by design uniformly distributed. But I mean, essentially, from a conceptual standpoint, it's the same. The second thing they do is they have a different objective than language modeling. Language modeling goes usually goes left to right. So that means the language model whenever it generates a token, it looks at what it's generated so far. And then from that it will generate the next token. And what it cannot do is it cannot look at the like right like the, the, the ahead, it cannot look ahead, you can't tell it, you know, here is a piece of text. And here is a piece of text, please fill in this piece of text, that would be a masked language model like BERT. Right? But some a model like BERT isn't really good at auto regressively generating text for that the left to right causally masked language models are much, much better. And, you know, uh, higher, higher performing. So is there a way we can get the best of both worlds, or at least some kind of a trade off turns out, yes, there is with the following objective. So as I said, we have an example right here in a standard language model, we have the following, the following thing, which is a way we can do entity linking, right? So imagine, imagine we'd have to predict this piece right here. So as you can see, this is the link, it's an it's an anchor tag. This is the link to the page, the Wikipedia page for American, sorry, Armenian, Armenian nationalism. Okay, so Armenian nationalism, we want to predict that link. Uh, which is essentially solving entity linking for this sentence. If we only have a causally masked language model, all we can do is, 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 is input this piece of text to the left. So this would be our entire context. Now, this example is constructed such that this thing right here, right, this word right here is really important to classifying to seeing what is there. Therefore, if we only had a causally masked language model, if we only ever trained left to right, we couldn't make use of the word that was behind right here. Uh, if we had something like a masked language model, we could absolutely do that. 
So that is this example right here. If we had a masked language model, then we could absolutely, um, we could do that. We could input this and we could input this and we could say, you know, here is a mask token. Uh, please generate what's in the mask token. However, we already discussed the weaknesses of that approach. Instead, they have a new objective, which they call a causally masked language model. Oh, I, I called this before causally masked language model, because there's also this sort of causal causal mask inside of it. I'm sorry, the causally masked language model is the thing they are going to propose. Inside of these language model, usually there is something like causal masking. So it's a it's a bit confusing. Uh, if I look at this right now, what they do is during training. So during training, what the mask language model would do is it would just mask out these parts, and then it would try to fill them in. This limits training because you can only mask out so much you can't train in parallel and so on. Whereas with the autoregressive language models, uh, you can train a lot of stuff in parallel, there is no none of these noise and so on everything's everything is decomposed nicely. Here, what we would do is we would take the things during training, we would simply have a span that we mask, but we don't just leave it away, we actually put it at the end. So and there is an identifier token right here to show you can see that this token right here and this token right here are the same. So we tell the language model, we tell it, look, here is a sentence, okay, there is a mask right here, there's something missing, it could be one or many tokens. And then here, we want you to generate that thing again. And the model simply has to generate the thing back here. There can be one mask tokens, there can be many of these mask tokens, in which case we just, you know, if we mask something else like this right here, we just put the corresponding token right here and ask the model to generate it on the model will learn if there are two mask tokens, the model will learn to after it finished the first uh, thing that it's supposed to produce to automatically um, put a the next mask token there. So that is that is the objective, it still benefits from this left to right thing. As you can see, we can train this left to right. Uh, once we reorder the sentence, we can just input the whole thing here into training, we can train it like a decoder only language model. And we get all the performance off of that. Uh, yet we can still do kind of like masking. So we get bi directionality by design, because now if we want to predict this mask right here, we have seen all of this context. So we essentially we have seen the whole the whole data point, we do sacrifice like a little bit um, of performance, uh, because well, inherently, this part here is still left to right. So that there's that, uh, like in itself, it's still left to right. Also, we do take stuff out of order. So there is the question of, you know, how long can I memorize stuff and so on with transformers, maybe a bit less, but we do take stuff out of order, which introduces some noise and so on. So it is definitely a trade off wherein pure language modeling is still going to be more powerful. But this now enables us this enables bi directional context essentially into the things that we generate. And that has a lot of advantages for many, many different tasks. So there is a whole scheme, it's it seems to be really important how exactly Oh, yeah, 256 tokens for each image. See, um, sorry, it seems to be quite important how you generate these masks during training, how long they are, they try to make them quite long in order for the model to learn uh, important structure and so on. We'll go through all of this in the interview. Um, the scaling laws are pretty, pretty astonishing in that they're large model right here. And these are large models, right? These are like the, the scale of this, uh, it was trained it was trained on 384 a 100 GPUs. No, I think that's even that's the base. Is that the baseline? That is even the baseline. Where is the where is their model? Um, yeah, I don't I don't currently I don't currently find it. But you can just see sort of the scale here of what they're going for. So this is these are not small models. But if you make them sufficiently large, you can see the largest models, they're not done training yet, uh, even after they put sufficient or put uh, enormous amounts of resources through them, you can see they're not even 
not even the same ahead, like the same advanced inside of the training. So yeah, this it, it is very promising. I think this is a very promising direction to make use of that, uh, to make use of the HTML structure. You can see a little bit here. So essentially, if you just put this as a prompt, you can have the model generate the alt text and the image at the same time, right? It interestingly chooses to put the alt text in front, like it, it chooses to generate a little description before it generates the images, which is interesting. You can also force it to first generate the image uh, by just putting the source tag directly. So then it needs to generate the image. And it's interesting because the quality of the images when you force it to generate image before alt text, um, it it is a lot lower, as you can see here, than if it just if you just let it generate the image, in which case it chooses to generate the alt text first, you can do many things, you can do image in painting by masking out a portion of the tokens of the image, you have to mask out entire tokens, but still, you can do like crude image infilling, you can do conditional infilling by providing alt text first, and then do infilling, uh, you can you can do conditional generation by providing alt text. So the the like the the possibilities are very, very great right here, you can see this is infilling conditional infilling, and so on, the possibilities are great. And remember, this is a very particular data sets and very particular cleaning methods of HTML, I believe if we extend this to even more structure and so on, maybe even take uh, cascading style sheets into account, take all of the structural elements of websites into account, uh, title tags, headers, footers, and so on. This could be could be really powerful um, beyond the applications that we see right here. It, they can also do text, pure text modality data sets, as we said, entity disambiguation by predicting hyperlinks, they also do get new state of the art in summarization in zero shot summarization, by simply generating like the, they simply generate like the title or the uh, the meta tag, the description tag of the website, to uh, so they give it a fake website with the text they want to summarize, and they generate these tags. Uh, they do say for complete list below is an example of a prompt that can do basic summarization. I did not find that prompt anywhere. So yeah, maybe I didn't I didn't look enough, or maybe lot text screwed up where <laughs> some kind of a figure is. Um, in any case, I don't want to go too much into the uh, results right here. But I think the direction of using that structured content is pretty cool. Uh, the new the new objective is also pretty cool. I do criticize a little bit that these two things are kind of decoupled from each other, like they could all be their own paper. Uh, and that's also something that we talk about in the interview. So in the interview, we're going to go briefly over the model again, uh, over the research process over what it means, uh, what it could enable, and uh, what difficulties there were and also over the results, which are extremely, extremely interesting. I enjoyed the interview a lot. I hope you do too. Tell me what you think of it. And now I'll, I'll leave it up for the interview. Thank you very much and have fun. Welcome everyone. Today I have with me Armin Agajanyan. And I've practiced that name 10 seconds ago, and I, th I think I got it down. Uh, Armin is the first author of the CM3 paper. Uh, welcome, uh, Armin, to the channel. Thank you for having me. So I, I saw this paper, and of course, you have like uh, some big names here. There's lots of authors, there's Facebook AI research. Um, but still, like given all of that, it was still impressive. Like I was I was impressed by the what it could do and and sort of the results it gave like it seems to be well there's zero shot there's image generation there is like a new objective there's html in there um so there's there seems to be a lot in one pot uh if you if you gave the pitch right i i, I will have made an introduction but if you gave the pitch to the paper what is it mainly about I mean, the goal here was kind of to have a single multimodal model that can do everything. Yeah. Um, image generation, image captioning, um, image infilling to, uh, to even pure text tasks like yeah. summarization, but mostly focusing on this zero shot setting specifically mm -hmm. this popping setting. And um, how did you like, were you 
where you this is a very popular thing i think in the last few years this came up maybe maybe starting with something like gpt3 where people could really say okay stuff is possible zero shot if we train on large enough data then came things like dali and so on where you know we saw for the first time okay maybe stuff is even possible in other modalities than text yeah. um this this goes even further this is multimodal uh there have been a lot of other approaches to multimodal there is like this this Ru, Rudol, rudolph even model i don't know if you've seen that it goes like image to text to image and so on and they all work let's say with very cleaned up data it's, it's very you know i want text i want I- images that go with the text which makes sense right how do you uh get how did you get the idea to use let's say relatively unstructured html uh for this like how did how did your thought process go until you came to this idea so usually there are pros and cons to having super strong alignment right mm. so like big dolly for example they have like a very specific alignment of like uh you know text on the left side and then you have like 1024 image tokens on the right side right super strong alignment uh, and in general it's easy for the models to kind of learn this type of single alignment but then you're incredibly limited on the prompting side and the thing is prompting is uh, i think it's incredibly creative um it's kind of if you have a general model, it, it takes a little bit of creativity to extract out the prompt. So the key here is we don't want to have any strict alignment uh, in terms of the modalities. Um, so the goal was like, what is the weakest alignment that we can go for that would still give us the ability to prompt in non-trivial ways? Mm-hmm. Um, so actually, this is kind of a follow-up to an older paper that we published. It was just accepted in IC- ICLR, actually, which was this HTLM paper. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the core idea of this paper is that we argued that document structure is really, really important. So what we did there is we took BART, BART large, and then we pretty much trained it on uh, just web data, like minimized HTML, right? Um, so minimal HTML is we pretty much do multiple passes over the DOM and take out anything that we don't think is semantically important. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that paper, we showed really strong results. So for example, for zero shot summarization, in, in, in a structured language like HTML, uh, this is pretty much just generating the title, right? Or generating the meta tag where, you know, the attribute is the headline, right? Mm-hmm. So in some sense, we could exactly replicate how CNN and Daily Mail was collected, which yep. was they looked for headlines, right? So in the prompt, you can actually describe the way that the data was collected. So we saw that there was some rich structure available to be used um, in HTML. So after Dolly came out, we thought, okay, um, there are some fundamental restrictions with Dolly. So the first one being the causal uh, approach. So they train a decoder only left to right model. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, you can't do things like generate the text given the image, right? Just because of the positioning of the image. It's it's on the right side of the input, right? You can't really do image infilling either. Um, which means conditioning on both the prefix and postfix of the image. It's not or, possible. Or you'd have to like train specifically mm-hmm. one particular type of infilling, right? You you could you could rearrange stuff such that you could infill one part, but you can't like dynamically infill something. Exactly. Yeah. So those were kind of the the first weaknesses uh, that we saw there. Uh, the approach was very clever, though. Right. So pretty much taking continuous data, discretizing it and just doing sequence modeling. It seems to work very, very well. Mm -hmm. So the idea went that we kind of combined the two from the HTLM paper, which was that, uh, you know, document structure through HTML is really important. But let's also encode images there and see if we can recover something like Dolly. Yeah. Um, So here you're kind of looking at the data that we collected. So the data set size is actually quite good. Uh, I mean, we're around like the 200 billion tokens. Uh, which is a relatively good size if you're training large models. Um, but one kind of downside that we have here is because we don't have the strict alignment, we can't artificially increase the amount of images that we have available in the documents. Yeah. If you actually look, I think we have 25 million unique images. Um, I don't know about Dolly. Dolly was trained on 400 million. I don't know how many of them are unique, but regardless, they have, still have an order of magnitude more images than mm-hmm. we do. Right. But then we have the other benefits, right? Which is we're also training on a ton of text. So we can do a lot of text only tasks. Uh, and I think the rest of the paper will show uh, that, you know, we can do not only text only tasks, but we're actually competitive to T5, which is actually really hard to do. Um, 
And I can explain why we think this is the case in a little bit. So the very first thing was, okay, so now we kind of have this data, but HTML is also very localized, right? Like the title always comes first. Yeah. Uh, or it's in the head, right? Or like the meta tags always pop up first, right? So if you want to generate meta tags or generate title, right? Condition on the rest of the text, it's kind of non-trivial how you would do this in decoder only setting. Yeah. And so we kind of started thinking, you know, there are multiple ways around this, right? So the first thing is use the encoder decoder architecture, right? Uh, and then with some masking, you can kind of recover this type of bidirectionality. Um, this is true, but there are pros and cons to this. So encoder decoder only architectures, uh, they're really good for fine tuning, but they're not so good for prompting is at least what we noticed. Um, and also training them is a little bit more non-trivial. So decoder only models are quite nice because you get per token generation. Uh, so you pretty much generate every token uh, for the source. Yeah. Um, whereas for encoder decoder, most of the time you're generating, I think like 15% is what Bert and like Bart or like Roberta do. It's all around that 15%. Mm. Um, so most of the times you have to go through the data multiple times. Um, for some reason, they don't prompt super well. Um, and the kind of the other big thing is if you want to do score based prompting, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to do with encoder decoder only architecture, right? Like if you want to ask what's the log probability of this sequence yep. with the math language model, it's kind of tough to do, right? Um, so we knew that we wanted to go kind of this decoder only route. So we introduced this new, uh, objective that we called causal masking. Um, and so the idea behind causal masking, uh, if you want to scroll down, I think yep. there's a, uh, there's a figure there. This one. Yeah. So the idea there is uh, relatively straightforward, right? So pretty much think of mask language modeling, uh, where you place in a mask, but take the mask uh, and put the put what the mask represents simply at the very end of the sequence. Um, so if you do this, you kind of get it's it's very very simple, right? Um, mm -hmm. But you get a lot of the benefits, which is you still get per token generation. Uh, you optionally allow for bidirectionality. Uh, which is actually a really, really big thing to have, right? Um, and the other thing that we noticed is that depending on the setting, prompting versus fine tuning, the size of the mask is really important. So for fine tuning, localized information is really important. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to have a lot of small masks. For prompting, we saw kind of the opposite, which is you want to have very, very few masks, but they can be very long. Mm -hmm. um, so the strategy that we used here is for every document, we sample from a Poisson distribution centered around one. Um, so, you know, the majority of times, right. And we clip it to one. So if you get zero, it becomes one, right? Yep. So majority of times you're only going to get a single mask, right? Over 50% of the time, you're only going to get a single mask. Uh, and then you pick a, you, you uniformly uh, sample a subset of the document of any size. Um, and you can, and you kind of place that in the end. So you get these very, very long kind of infilling naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this objective turned out to be quite strong. Um, so it's competitive to language modeling in the sense that when you get per token generation, our perplexities were not that much higher than just a language modeling objective. Mm -hmm. Um, you get optional bidirectionality whenever you want it, right? You can score probabilities, uh, of sequences super, super easily. Um, so we're kind of going all in on this objective. And so we have some follow up work looking at, um, causal masked, uh, scaling loss for text. So yep. this is some ongoing work that we have now. Um, so we're pushing heavily on this. Um, so the general argument that we're trying to build is that, you know, if you're doing language modeling, uh, decoder only language modeling, you should be doing causal mass to language modeling. So that's this kind is, of my... Yeah, I mean, I was... I was it, it is intuitively a good trade-off. So I think here you make the case, if, if I interpret this correctly, that this word nationalist right here is really important to fill in this mask. And, and if, it, if it were just sort of left to right, it would be very difficult to fill this in. Yet, yeah. since you move it to the end, right? And, and the, the model has to extra learn kind of to uh, keep these, mm -hmm. these tokens in context to sort of realize, you know, what's there. So it, it has some, to waste kind of some extra memory uh, yeah. to, to remember the context of each of the mask tokens and so on. But um, yeah, I, I think it is very intuitive. It's also a good trade-off between, I want to say, left to right has, at least for, you know, most, there are right to left languages, but for left to right languages, left to right objective actually makes sense, right? That, that is how we generate language 
you know, when we write it down. So there is something to left to right. That I was never happy. There are other other approaches like XLNet or so. Mm -hmm. They were saying, well, we just train on all possible paths, right, of decoding, like all possible sequence of masking out tokens. And it was it was never really satisfying because I always thought, well, there is something to left to right. Mm -hmm. However, sometimes, as you say, it's really important to know what's after. And uh, and yeah. and I think this is like a really good trade off. Yeah, like specifically in this example, right? Like in the zero shot prompting case, right? Like let's say we want to tag nationalist with some entity link, right? Um, if it appears beforehand in the sequence, there's no way to prompt a language model to generate like an entity link before the entity appears, right? Yeah. Uh, so that was kind of another reason that we had because like I said, like HTML data is very localized, right? Like in Wikipedia, this, this A tag, which represents the entity link always appears before the entity. Yeah. Either uh, we have the option of, you know, training two models, right? One left to right, one right to left. Um, um, or you can kind of do this kind of clever rotation of the document, mm -hmm. um, you said. Uh, yeah, the Excelnet approach is definitely interesting, uh, which is, you know, having different permutations of the source document. But uh, like you said, I think there's a lot of inductive bias um, for left to right, which is why I think left to right models are kind of de facto now. Is there... Just, just for my understanding, is there a reason behind these arrows? Like, why do the arrows like are like double arrows? Then there's a line, and there's like a double arrow again. Like, is, is does that have a specific uh, meaning? And here, the arrows are only here. Yeah. So arrows pretty much uh, was the tokens that you actually generate. So okay. If you're a language model, you're generating every token, and in the mass. Also, oh, you go like yeah. this. Okay, yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. Because I was, I was like, okay, is, is there some meaning? But yes, there is. Mm -hmm. And this shows that in the mask language model objective, you only actually generate a very small number of tokens and you, yeah. you wouldn't even get like a loss for the other tokens. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, you said before that uh, you had a certain number of tokens, right? With, and you said, well, that's actually good or bad for, you know, that's actually in a good order for language modeling. Yet... Mm -hmm. A special thing about your model is that images are also tokens. Uh, yeah. You 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 push images through a, a VQ VQ GAN encoder, right? Um, which is pre-trained, mm -hmm. and these image these just become tokens in uh, in 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 whatever sequence. Do you? And this results obviously in larger data because some of it is images so you say you have a terabyte of data in this data set which mm -hmm. is obviously way larger than for example uh, a text only data set do you find there is a difference like do you find the number of tokens is really what matters in the size of the data or is there a qualitative difference between image data and text data even though both are tokens um yeah, so there's a couple ways to approach this. So the, the very first thing is that modeling, and I think we mentioned this quickly in the paper, but modeling image tokens versus text tokens, it's quite different actually. So for like text usually follows, like textual tokens follow like a Zipfian distribution, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, I think in the appendix we have a figure, it's pretty much uniform for images. Yeah. Uh, so there's different, like uh, in terms of the distributions that you have to predict, they're actually quite different. So we saw a little bit of challenges and we saw some kind of weird behavior during training. We didn't mention this in the paper, but the one weird behavior that we saw was that there were uh, regimes during the training, like parts of the training that only optimized for text. So on our image evaluations, like it pretty much would be flat. And then there were times that it was quite the opposite where, you know, images would be being optimized for, but text kind of stayed flat. So we don't really have explanations for why this is happening. Um, I think there needs to be future like scaling laws, looking at multimodal sequence modeling. Mm -hmm. And when I say multimodal, I'm not just talking about like images and like natural language text. I meant like you can even include code as a different modality, right? Yeah. Um, so the scaling laws there, I think are a little bit different than what we're used to with text. Mm -hmm. um, the reason for using tokens is purely because of a compute thing, right? So, uh, you know, we're given some amount of GPUs, right? For some amount of times. Uh, so what we do is we take the number of, uh, tokens that we have, we take the amount of compute that we have and try to find the largest size model that we can train. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like an optimization problem to find the 
largest architecture. Um, so that's kind of why we used um, number of tokens as the as the guiding principle. I mean, it it seems to also align with what others. Yeah, for example, this the Rudolph uh, paper. So that it seems to be a common approach to lift images into like the space of textual tokens, which is, sur I guess, a bit surprising because a couple of years ago, no one would have gone that route. Even if you even if you were to inject images into a sequence model, you'd probably inject like a single vector, right? Um, and so I I find that to be well a bit surprising, but also, uh, yeah, it seems appropriate that an image could be expressed in something like a sequence of tokens. It's mm -hmm. it's just a bit. I'm not too big of a fan of how this is currently done because the tokens they also. Like they all already they seem to be a bit localized in the image and so on. Like I don't, I yeah. I think there's a, like a better, I don't think there's a better way. If if you're a human, you're not. That's not really what you do with an image. You you see more like, like the different layers maybe or 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 what's there. In any case, I was surprised by these scaling plots. Like these are these are brutal. Like this is like we scale it up and it just like the 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 loss goes down for the largest model it seems that you're nowhere near done right yeah. like this this just so you you said you had some different experiences during training uh yet also i think in the paper somewhere you you hinted at well we didn't really see any pathologies uh so what's like what's what was the the process like you had the data you trained the thing did it immediately work um, it took a little bit of handholding to work, especially the, the 13 billion parameter model took a little bit of handholding to work. So a lot of the times the pathologies we see is, are things like gradient underflow or overflow, mm. uh, gradient explosions happen, although they're more, they usually happen in much bigger models, like the hundred billion scale. Um, but the surprising thing was that we almost used exactly the same hyperparameters, um, as this paper that came out from Vesto in those group, um, so the surprising thing is it kind of just worked out of the box, apart from having to tune, I think we tuned tune like learning rate. Um, we had to tune weight decay mm -hmm. uh, and batch size. Apart from tuning those things, it just worked almost straight out of the box. Um, and what you said is actually correct, which is if you look at the large model, it's actually not done training. Um, so the good news is once once CM3 is released, we're gonna release the, the checkpoint that we use for this model. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I think the model that we have now is continuing training, so we'll really use that one too. So uh, people will be able to play around with both. Excellent. Uh, uh, but one thing I'd like to point out is that the multimodal scaling laws are a little bit different than, than text scaling laws. Um, one thing seems to be that scale plays a slightly larger role um, in multimodal than it does in text. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the qua the quantitative thing that we saw is that if you looked at the data efficiency jumps between like, uh, I'm forgetting the exact numbers, but like, like let's make them up. Like the 1.3 billion model and the 13 billion model from, from Vess's paper. Mm -hmm. um, and the data efficiency there, well, let's say it was like the larger model was five times more efficient in terms of data. So uh, in order to reach the same perplexity, it would need five times less data. Uh, using these same exact models, we saw that in the multimodal case, it was 10x. So there was always, almost a two times difference for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I think it's really important to kind of chase these multimodal scaling laws and fundamentally understand what's going on here. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns here. When you say we had to do a little bit of hand-holding, what, what does that even mean in these large models? Like, can you afford to restart training? Or, or is it more like, you know, you have checkpoint, checkpoint, and then something goes wrong and you go back to the last checkpoint and you do something there? Like, what, what, is, what does the process of training these very large models look like? It's just really, really tedious. So one of the main things is, um, you know, whenever you have a ton of nodes that you're running, there's infrastructure issues that pop up, right? Yeah. So like if one GPU goes down, right, then, then all of training is paused, right? So infrastructure issues are kind of a big thing. And we have some automated systems in place to take care of that. Mm -hmm. um, the other things are like, um, for example, like uh, we didn't set a high enough warm-up period in the beginning. 
So we saw that we actually had to pause training, increase the warm up, load up the last checkpoint, mm-hmm. and go from there. Um, and so we also kind of tune learning rate a little bit as training goes on. Um, although with the large models, I think it might have been just a handful of times. Um, so well, failures. Do you, do you always have like multiple models running ahead, and then you choose the one that looks best, or is it really like you change and you train one model and you see how it develops? Yeah, uh, because of the computer, it's one model. So it, yeah. it really comes down to intuition. Um, so both Mike Lewis and Naman Goyal, who are on the paper, have trained these really, really big models before. Um, so they had a ton of great intuition about how to get things to work um, in terms of these very large models. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Cool. I mean, yeah, I, I'm I'm excited. And it's very cool that you, you actually are going to release uh, these things. I think people will love to play around with them uh for in order to do now the the tasks uh you tackled some tasks how did you decide which there are some natural tasks let's say there there are some that are more you know you have to come up with something um did you have some targets of tasks that you want to tackle or was it more like the model came first and then you you sat down and saw what can you actually do with it and what not like and what worked and were, were there also tasks that you tried that maybe didn't work at all? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I, I think at the beginning of the project, the, the push was really to have a single model uh, that can do any image task in the zero shot case. Mm-hmm. Um, and so kind of the story that we built around it is, can we describe all the tasks that we're interested in um, through some prompt, through some HTML prompt, even before we trained the models, we yeah. thought about this. So we came up with a ton, right? Um, and some some prompts were very complicated, like style transfer for one, one, right? So you can have an image that has a picture of the mountains in the summer, um, and then you have another image tag that says the same picture, but in the winter, and then you ask the model to predict the image tokens, right? So you can get this kind of zero shot style transfer. Yeah. So you have some kind of complex prompts, um, so some of them didn't work. Some of them only worked at scale, and we can kind of go go through this. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically, like one thing is that like the captioning only worked at scale. So okay. the thirteen billion model was the only model that could caption well. And the captioning, you go mainly with the alt text of the image. Alt or the title, either yeah. one. Yeah. Um, but like the figure that you're on now, I think is kind of interesting. So we can kind of get unconditional image generation by just asking the model to generate. A sequence of tokens after the image tag. Right? Yeah. So we saw one interesting behavior is that the model, for some reason, almost always wanted to first generate the alt text before generating the image. Um, mm-hmm. For it, it was actually easier to condition on the te- on the text before generating an image than doing this type of freeform generation. Um, when you say it wanted to, it that's just what it did. Yeah. Like when you when yeah. you sampled, did you like? I mean this. When you say it wanted to, it could also be that in the internet, humans most of the time write alt first and then the source. Yeah, so we actually looked into this. So uh, a lot of text does have alt, um, but it's around like, I want to say like 70 to 80% mark, if I recall correctly. So it wouldn't explain why the model almost always wants to generate alt text. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the theory that we kind of have is that without alt text, you have much higher perplexities for images. Mm-hmm. So the model, you know, even, cause, because we're doing like sampling, right? So it's going to pick out high probability, low perplexity tokens, yeah. which most of the case means picking out the alt yeah. uh, just because it appears so often. Um, so that could be it. But uh, overall, I think if you look at these images, they're, they're rather like they're semi-coherent, uh, especially the ones conditioned on the text. Um, and the same thing I think you see with, you can kind of force the model not to generate the alt text by giving yeah. a prompt and to generate the image tokens immediately. And do you, do you uh, think, so the, 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 v, like the VQGAN tokens, naturally they are predicted as one, right? Um, there is, there's some encoder, they're not, as, as far as I understand, they're not in the image encoder that makes the tokens, they're not predicted autoregressively. So there is no inherent sequence nature to these tokens could mm-hmm. that be like some sort of a reason why there's also a difference because text naturally is sequential whereas these tokens the only thing they have is they're they're kind of localized but there's no 
inherent sequential nature. Yeah, that's true. There, there isn't for VQV again. There isn't something explicit, but mm -hmm. the, I think the way that the layers are constructed, you do still get some implicit dependencies across yeah. the visual tokens. And so I think this is what the transformer is kind of pulling apart here. Yeah. Um, yeah. And to be honest, I think there's still a lot of work to be done on the discretizing images front. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing about like VQV again is that it blurs a lot of fine detail. So like human faces. Um, in our case, this is kind of good because it's privacy preserving. You're not going to generate like a person's face um, unless it's a really, really popular and like close up face. Mm -hmm. um, so in our case, it kind of worked out. But in the future, I think we need to get much, much higher fidelity um, image tokens if we think that the way of doing things is to treat everything as a token. Um, of course, I think there are a ton of new approaches that are not token-based. I think Glide was fantastic from OpenAI. The diffusion models are doing great generative work. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to maintain the same um, benefits of generative models, um, so being able to generate trivially, um, being able to compute log probabilities, I think tokens are probably the easiest way to go. Yeah. Uh, and one thing is you can naturally increase the resolution of tokens images just by increasing how many tokens you use per image. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, if you have enough compute, you can scale up to arbitrary resolutions, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Down to probably, probably you could at some point get more, more tokens than pixels. I wouldn't know what, what that would mean, but. Um, I guess the resolution isn't even limited by the resolution of the image itself. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's this this interesting thing you can do, as you said, infilling uh, by letting the model generate sort of middle tokens. Now, you I mean you could probably do arbitrary infilling, but you have to have like multiple mask tokens. So I guess the the natural thing to do is just to infill. Uh, since the tokens kind of go left to right, top to bottom, is to infill one of these stripes, which you've demonstrated right here. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Did you did you try infilling like arbitrary things, or or was this sort of the natural thing to do? Yeah. So actually, because of our objective, because we sample the number of masks, right? Yeah. Um, you can actually mask out like five, six, seven masks. Yeah. And it still work. Um. I don't think there was any specific reason that we stuck to masking out a single thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure it would work with multiple as well. I mean, uh, if you like, if you were to, if you were to infill, let's say, you know, if I infill a square like this, um, and it it covers sort of multiple token lines, this would already result in like if it covers three token lines, it would already result in like three mask no. tokens, right? So, yeah. I mean, that there is there is some. With just with the the sequential nature, uh, but I think that can be can be worked around. So um, what here we see, so left is a source image. Then you mask out something in the middle. Um, then you also give the ground truth, which is here on the right. And then there's one model that does infilling unconditional, so just looking at the image. And then there is one model that does it conditionally, and the conditional is. Uh, conditioned with this thing right here as the the alt text. So mm -hmm. do you understand? Exactly. Okay. So understand it correctly. Um, I was yeah. I mean, I was surprised. For example, by this one right here, this uh, the park bench. Because obviously, if you see the the model that does infilling conditionally, it can do it quite well. However, the unconditional one, it kind of warps the bench or something like this. Like, it's it's a bit. I, I'm not I'm not sure the unconditionality has something much to do with it because there is no. This doesn't look like natural. You know, you know what I mean a little bit. Like, yes, yeah, so, this this, so. this shouldn't be like just because it's not conditioned on it. If it's not conditioned on text, I would expect it to be maybe a red bench, right, or or something, you know, something uh, that is conceivable in nature, but is not according to the text. Like there is an ambiguity of what's behind the mask. However, here it it really seems to degrade in performance when you don't give it the text. Yeah. So so one theory that we kind of had here. 
um, is that the the model needs to understand the continu continuation of the the horizontal lines, right? Mm -hmm. And that, re that requires some semantic understanding that this is, for example, uh, a bench, right? And actually, if you look at the the masked out input, the horizontal lines are not completely horizontal, so the bottom of the bench is at a different angle than yeah. the top of the bench. So I think the model has a tough time understanding the the high level semantic content of the yeah. image, which is fixed by feeding in text. Yeah. Uh, now I think, of course, if you have, I think if you have a larger model that's trained for longer with a higher resolution, uh, this probably should not be an issue. Mm -hmm. um, but VQV again, it, it blurs out a lot of things. Number one. Yeah. Uh, and number two, it's um, just if you change the tokens even a little bit. The, the blurring aspect happens very, very quickly with VQVA again, mm -hmm. compared to, for example, the VQVA from Dolly, um, which requires more tokens, so 1024 tokens versus the 256 we use here. Um, but uh, it's more direct in some sense. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think the main thing here is just that you need to get some like high level semantic information about what's going on in the image. Um, and it's hard to do if you're only looking at like the VQVA. GAN tokens. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that makes makes sense. You go on and you have some examples of uh, conditional image generation. So on the left side here is a prompt, and then you sample uh, images from that with the same technique, right? You give the alt text, and mm -hmm. then you sample the image. So the... <laughs> The avocado chair is is like forever going to be to stick in history, right? I think that's just that's just a given. Um, was there one? Was there something that surprised you uh, with um, conditional image generation? Yeah, so the the models are are quite good at actually generating something that's somewhat coherent. So, yep. uh, if, for example, like the red car, you can see it generates. You know, two red cars. That one looks like a truck or a tractor. Um, sometimes the model tries to cheat and, and generate something that's easy. For example, the in the case that it doesn't generate a car at all, it just generates mountains, right? Mm -hmm. Just because the landscapes are easier to generate. Um, the other thing that we saw kind of tough compared to Dali is, you know, the data that we used only came from Wikipedia or Common Crawl News, so none of it was fictional in some sense, right? Like we don't have any like art. Yeah. Um, so like our images always try to be as non-fictional as possible, which is, it acts weird if you try to give it, um, like really fantasy based prompts. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of one downside. And actually this is one criticism I have uh, of the evaluation that we did for the FID matrix, which is a way to measure, uh, you know, the, the quality of images, uh, which is, uh, we actually took the table from Glide, um, for the FID numbers on the conditional mm -hmm. generation. Uh, one thing was, is that MS Coco is all like, almost all nonfiction, yeah. uh, like non-fantasy images. So this is really sh like, it's underrepresenting Dolly. So I think if you casted a wider net here and had something that included a wider array, uh, a, a bigger distribution of images, I think Dolly's results here would be uh, much, much stronger. Yeah. Uh, which is why I think we're kind of comparable. Our largest model is comparable to Dolly on MS Coco, but in terms of image generation, it's not as good um, on the like the fantasy front at all. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You you did you did discuss a little bit. You also said you had you you saw subsampled uh, web data and 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 you cited some concerns as well. Um, but there is also a quality issue with sort of the the wider you cast the net. Uh, the sort of more the quality goes down, I guess the alt the alt tags quality go down, whether or not the images even have alt tags, whether or not they're ads or something like this. Um, what were like why did you limit to this subset of the data and not bigger or smaller? I think at the beginning we had some ethical concerns of like like I said, we have very weak alignment, so you can prompt with anything, right? Yeah. We had some ethical concerns about images that you can generate if you were just trained on all of Common Crawl. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to think about what are like large scale data sets that we can get that are somewhat filtered. Uh, Wikipedia is definitely one of them. Um, but even then, actually, Wikipedia itself has a gender bias. And I think this is a new, I think other papers have showed this before. And Common Crawl News, which probably is not going to have the, the terrible content that we don't want to pick up. 
Yeah. Um, so we kind of picked those two and it was okay at the scale that we wanted to. So we stuck with those two. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I think it's hard. I, I, I don't know what the solution is. Like the, the lay on 400 million data set that was released. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it, uh, but, uh, this data set, I think there was a critique paper written like a month about it, right? That showed that it was like a highly, highly problematic data set. So in terms of the ethical approach, I'm not really sure what the right answer is for collecting at scale. Um, there are tricks you can do, right? So like if you look at the CC100 data set that Facebook collected, they use this trick that, you know, they train a language model on Wikipedia and then use it to score a common crawl and then take only like medium perplex yeah. things from common crawl. So you could probably do something like this here. Yeah. Um, I, I question the efficacy just because very large models, they only need to see a data point a couple times in order to pick it up. Um, so uh, I think there's like some very fundamental engineering work that that's being done in, for scaling up these data sets to like, um, like uh, trillions of tokens, essentially, um, um, and billions of images. Yeah, um, I mean... I guess it casts much wider questions such as, uh, you know, I as a human, I'm, I'm perfectly ga capable of going to 4chan and, and seeing kind of the worst of humanity. And, and it doesn't instantly make me like, you know, a, a, I don't know, a terrible, terrible, like it, it doesn't want, make me want to repeat everything or something like this. And, and there's there's various considerations, like shouldn't we be able to build model that also ingests stuff, but kind of may also a bit distinguish between things like if the models are able to distinguish it might help them to ingest more of this critical data on the other hand i can absolutely understand that especially if you're the maker of a model you don't want your model to output you know that i think that's why for example OpenAI keeps such a tight grip on on gpt3 if you want to build anything with it right you have to go through approval processes and whatnot and uh it's it's uh yeah it's i think it's a tricky topic I, I also don't know what exactly to do i'm happy that there are models that are filtered like say unfiltered data i'm happy that there also exist models that aren't um yeah i, f I think the maybe the sort of the let's say diversity makes is is probably the best so you can always choose which one you want to you want to use i don't know i'm oh, sorry this is just a rant by now um you, you do have yeah, some I, sorry go ahead i, I was gonna say oh, w w with respect to what you're saying there's the solution doesn't necessarily have to lie on the language model side yeah um, so one thing is you can think of language modeling as just pure density estimation over tokens right so if you're doing that like of course, you're going to model like 4chan, for example, right? But it's up to your generative sampling strategy to remove that part of the density and only sample from, you know, parts of the density estimation that you know are, are safe, for example. Um, and so we're actually seeing, I think, a lot of movement from, you know, having a singular model that does generative work uh, into having like multiple models. So a great example is like Dolly, right? So they do density estimation over, you know, text and image tokens, right? Uh, but the way they generate images is they sample like 128 candidates and or, or whatever number of candidates, and then they use Clip, a secondary model, to kind of uh, select in some sense the mode of the slice of the density, yeah. right? Um, and so something probably similarly can be done here. Like a great example is like take Codex, for example, right? I think in the Codex paper, what they do is they generate a ton of samples and then they re-rank the samples uh, in terms of perplexity, so average log probability, and then they take the mode. So essentially, the exact mode of that uh, density estimation, right? Yeah. So one thing to argue is that you know you could you could train language models that do pure density estimation over all the text that we have, and then have smarter generation algorithms that are able to select subsets of that density that are safe. Um, so like you said, I, I, for, for in terms of research, I think there's, there's pros and cons to having unfiltered and filtered models. But that's kind of the way I've been thinking about it recently. Yeah, and it's, it's probably a good approach because the sort of the handle we have on, let's say, discriminative models like Clip is a lot larger than the handles we have really on, on generative models like 
yeah the only the only handle really we have there is is kind of data yeah yeah. Um, you also do some experiments on text pure. I, mean, I, wanna, I don't want to say pure text data because it's more than that, right? It's entity disambiguation, entity linking, and so on. Now, is that purely a result of the fact, like, of you use Wikipedia as a data source, and Wikipedia is essentially it's not really only text. It's kind of a huge entity link and database. Is that is that kind of is it fair to say that? it works really well because you use Wikipedia as data or is there something more to it? Yeah, no, that's exactly it. So actually, uh, um, there's this work that I, we said in this paper a couple of times, the genre paper. So in the genre paper, I, I think the paper is called autoregressive entity linking or entity disambiguation. So the idea there was exactly that, which is, you know, you if you take all of Wikipedia and then you train a language model um, that... Uh, tries to predict the entity link post entity, mm -hmm. um, you get a model that does really, really good entity linking, right? So in some sense, the genre objective was a subset of our much more general objective, yeah. right? Uh, and it's not too surprising we beat out genre just because our models are bigger um, mm -hmm. in the in, in our fine tuning case. But the really, really cool thing I think was that we can do this, the zero shot, which is exactly what I showed in the first figure. Um, you know, if you mask out the entity, if you know that you want this entity, you want to disambiguate this entity, you can place a mask there with this A tag, right? Uh, and then our model will fill in what it thinks the disambiguation is. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. Uh, I couldn't find any like zero shot baselines like this. So I think this is kind of the first paper to do this um, type of zero shot entity linking and disambiguation. And so, I mean, you also have, you also have other tasks like uh, summarization. Uh, we also didn't look at the, con like the, the, uh, the alt text generation and so on. Is there one result that we didn't talk about that you want to highlight in particular, like what maybe one surprised you the most or so? Yeah, so so the captioning one was interesting. I think we can look at that. Yeah. So the captioning is, this is pretty much the duel of Dolly, right? So what we're doing is saying, okay, you know, give, now that you have an image, generate the alt text for me given the image, right? So in, in some sense, we can exactly describe the captioning task in HTML, which is again, kind of, solidifies the argument that you want some level of document structure for prompting. Uh, so the results are, are quite uh, good, actually, at least from a semantic level. Mm -hmm. So one problem is that we don't actually generate in the style of, uh, I think, MS Coco here. Um, so we didn't report like blue four uh, numbers or like the standard numbers. But if you look at the semantic uh, uh, similarity using BERT score, the the CM3 captioning with clip as a re-ranker is actually a very, very strong baseline. Um, and so you can kind of see the style here is weird. It tries to explicitly state what type of airplane it is. Yeah. Uh, uh, but that's kind of an interesting behavior. Uh, so I think definitely at scale, uh, you know, you could get a single model that I think could be competitive with MS Coco, uh, like caption only models. Uh, if you do things like increase the resolution of the tokenized images, um, I think scale is really important here. So if you just scale up um, so that you have a similar amount of samples that are trained using MS Coco. You, you've said this a couple of times now, this sort of, um, you know, with scale, we could beat this or that. or um, And I, I guess you see this work a little bit as a maybe a signpost, you know, to like later work that actually achieves this scale do you think the scale you're talking about the scale at which you know the this is competitive with on ms coco uh where the image generation is competitive with dali um do you think that scale is currently achievable or is it so large that it's kind of well you know we we, we need entirely new hardware yeah, I think it is achievable. So uh, let me tell you about a result that we just got a couple of days back that's not in the paper here. So one one reason that we also changed uh, chased this kind of multimodal setup is because we're interested, or at least I'm very personally interested in the grounding aspect of language. So, um, so we kind of define grounding as, can you improve uh, document level perplexity on text by extra conditioning on images? So that's one uh, 
kind of way to measure grounding. The other way to measure grounding is, is we call it symmetrical grounding. So what you do is uh, given a, uh, pretty much given a, a, a piece of text, generate an image from that piece of text, and then condition on that image, generate back that piece of text, right? Yeah. And then look at the perplexity differences between the two texts, and that will give you the informational content of that image that is generated, right? So you can measure grounding that way. The unfortunate thing is that even the 13 billion parameter model that we have here did, doesn't ground. But if you look at the scaling laws um, from, you know, our, I think our 100 million parameter model to our 13 billion parameter model, around the 60 billion mark is where we'll see grounding in this setup. Okay. It's kind of a linear plot. So our expectation is that if you scale this up to 60 billion, that you should be able to achieve, I think, language image grounding, which is kind of a cool result that I think a lot of people have been chasing here. Um, and that's it's 60 insa billion. It's insane that you can make these predictions, right? That this is like this is something I think in machine learning is something new, uh, because right now, no one could tell. The most people could tell was like GPT three is going to be like somewhat better than GPT two, but mm -hmm. now you're you're able and you know I I am confident that this is a you know maybe it might be whatever fifty or eighty billion parameters, but you you can actually make these predictions, which is which is you know it's it's cool. Like I'm amazed by this. Yeah, I definitely don't think we're going to be like an order of magnitude off, right? Yeah. So so I, I think with the hundred billion parameter. 100 billion or 175 billion like gpt3 size we can get very very non-trivial behavior um to the point of being competitive across all tasks um and i i think the future in general is having a single multimodal model um that can prompt in an instructable way kind of like instruct gpt but with all modalities um so i think that's kind of the north star that everyone is chasing right now um but i think we have a good uh I think we have a solid base for this work. Um, but yeah, I think the, the captioning surprised me. And one thing that I want to call out here is that it only worked at the 13 billion scale. I might have mentioned this earlier. So there are fundamental stepwise changes in behavior from scaling up the model. It's not something smooth, right? So something that a 13 billion model can do is something that, uh, you know, like a 2.7 billion model will not be able to do at all. So you won't, it's just going to generate random stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting to see what the next, you know, stepwise changes in behavior will be if you scale this up. Um, With respect to the HTML, right, mm -hmm. uh, that you use, which is, I I thought it was it was pretty cool because it is data that is you know so available, and your argument is a little bit that. If you clean the HTML too much, right? These other these other data sets, they just pull out the text content, maybe the image, they try to align it and so on. You know, if you clean that up, there's so much structure missing, right? You're missing on all of this valuable information. Yet you also do cleaning, right? You do quite a lot of, of HTML cleaning. You, you say somewhere up here in, in the data section, uh, we strip this, we strip that, any, any sort of non non whatever elements we strip out uh, all headers all footers copyrights forms dialogue boxes uh, we merge consecutive div elements and so on couldn't the same argument be made against you uh, saying well you're losing so much of the structure there's so much information there like why are you doing this do you think there is a valid direction to go in actually taking in even more context of these html documents yeah, so th there are different constraints here, right? So one thing that I mentioned is that we can only uh, model X amount of tokens, right? 300 mm -hmm. billion tokens, for example, right? So if the majority of those tokens, right? Like I, I think the average document is like 95% of the document we removed. So yeah, in some still, sense, right? Yeah. Even though, even though you're the ones that remove way less than the other ones. Yeah. So so in some sense, do, do we want to model every single token. So in, in the case that you have infinite compute, sure, mm -hmm. right? Um, but here there's kind of a min-max problem that you have to solve, right? Which is you want to kind of, you want to maximize the amount of semantic information that is available while minimizing the amount of tokens that you have, right? Uh, and, and, and this is kind of complex to do. So I think we found a good enough balance of the two. 
Um, like in most cases, like you don't want to repeat the same copyright like 400 million times, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, there, so there's that, there's probably a lot of information in the fact that jQuery is imported in this website, right? <laughs> right. So um, things like that. But we also do things that might break document structure, like the merging of div elements, right? There's probably something there as to why the person has multiple div elements, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but regardless, we remove it. The other thing that we remove is attributes. So we remove all the attributes except those that are structured. So like open graph schema, I think Twitter has a, like a structured graph mm -hmm. uh, as well. Uh, and the reason there was that the attributes were just, first of all, they were way too long most of the time. Um, and they were not informationally rich enough. Um, so you kind of have to balance compute here with how much, uh, structural information you want to maintain. Yeah. I see. Um, and so there's, there's no fundamental reason to use HTML, right? It's just something that's there, right? There's, mm -hmm. I mean, for example, you can use Markdown as well, right? And you can kind of recover a lot of the same things, right? Like generating the title you can do in Markdown, mm -hmm. right? Hyperlinks you can do in Markdown, right? Um, so maybe the future direction is, you know, explicitly codifying this min-max problem, right? And coming up with the document structure that the document structure is described in the minimal set of tokens. Mm. Um, so maybe that's, you know, that, that's a pure engineering project as well. Um, but yeah. When you, when you think of HTML and the DOM, it is a tree, right? Mm -hmm. Which is different from a linear sequence. Uh, do you, do you think there is, do you think there's value in treating the tree as a tree. Do you think it's mainly a limitation of the models we have? They go, let's say, le like see, token by token or left to right or something like this. Uh, do you think, you know, maybe it's still good to treat it as a sequence because there's text in there and text is left to right? Like what keeps us from building tree-based models, which would be much more appropriate for something like this? Yeah, so... One thing about transformers is it seems that they can learn the inductive bias of the data fairly well, mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily encoded. Um, so my argument to this is that usually for these large scale runs, the best thing is just to keep it as simple as possible, mm -hmm. mostly just because they're risky, right? You get one chance. Um, but the other reason is that transformers are actually highly capable of picking up um, this type of um, structure. Yeah. So. This isn't in the paper, but we looked at attention scores and, and then you can, you can see very clearly that the model knows what are like boundaries between HTML elements, um, for example. But I, but again, there's also a ton of work to be done as well. So like some exciting work is, I think you also interviewed like Ofer, uh, with, for the alibi work, right? Like that work is really clever, right? Cause it introduces an explicit inductive bias that the further away a token is probably less likely that you are to look at it. And it gets rid of the need for, you know, positional uh, representations. Yeah. So you can imagine like an extension of Alibi here that would directly encode a tree-like uh, structure, right? Um, so there's a ton of work to be done here. And the other thing is we, were, we, were, we didn't do too much for the images, right? Like in terms of attending, like the positional representations for images are different than of text, right? So future work should consider like uh, specifically uh embedding images in such a way that you know you maintain locality of positions right mm -hmm. um, so this is all stuff that needs to be done in the future as well uh, but that being said i think if you have enough compute these models can learn anything it mostly becomes an efficiency angle yeah uh, going forward so about this paper so what what i have a bit of a trouble with is you know too many things in one paper which in this case is it's this idea of using HTML and so on, although there was a previous paper uh, of that, but then there's also the new loss um, and so on. Have you like tested the new loss on pure text generation? Uh, something like this, would, would this be like, can you, can you parse out sort of what, what, what the different things contribute to the, the success of these models? Yeah, and, and that's a great criticism of the paper actually. So fundamentally, I think, if we wanted to do this like the proper science way, this would be like four or five papers, um, just teasing things apart. Um, but uh, at the same time, when you're training these large language models, ablation studies are pretty much impossible, right? 
No yeah. one has that much compute to do these ablation studies. Uh, but the answer is yes. So we're looking at causal mass scaling loss for text only. Mm -hmm. This is a project that we're working on. We've trained a code model um, using the causal mass objective um, that's you know outperforming, uh, I think, both Google and Codex of similar sizes, mm -hmm. while being able to have a bidirectional, uh, with bidirectional option. Yeah. So um, there are a couple teams within Facebook that are trying out this objective with some success. Um, so uh, there will be future work about this. Excellent. Absolutely. And apart from what you just mentioned and scale, what's sort of next in this in this direction? Are you like what are you excited about? Maybe it's not even you working on it, but what kind of is your is exciting th stuff that's happening? So one thing is figuring out a way to have higher fidelity. So mm -hmm. the question to ask here is how do you represent continuous data in a discrete domain? Um, and I don't think we're there yet, right? Um, so that's some fundamental work that needs to move forward. Um, the other thing that I'm kind of interested in looking is um, can we start joining more modalities, right? So like Hubert that also came from, from uh, Facebook had a... Uh, speech tokens, right? Mm -hmm. um, very simple. I think they use k-means. I might be wrong, though, uh, uh, just to find discrete tokens for speech. So imagine that you have a single model that has video images, you know, text, yeah. uh, right, speech, everything kind of put into one, right? Like what level of grounding and what level of zero-shot prompting can you get here? Um, and I think a lot of people are kind of chasing this at, at the bigger companies. Um, I'm kind of excited about that. On the analysis front, I think there's a still a lot of unknowns about transformers. Like fundamentally, we're still using a four-year-old uh, implementation, right? Yeah. The, the only difference is just pre-layer norm, right? Yeah. From the original transformer. So I think better fundamentally understanding um, transformers. And I have some qualms with scaling laws. Like I, I don't think perplexity is necessarily the measure that we should be using. Mm -hmm. um, so internally, uh, we've been discussing like what does like memory based scaling laws look like. So if you use memory as the fundamental unit of transformers, what do those scaling laws look like? Right? Um, so there's some more fundamental work to be done there. Um, and the other thing is bridging fine tuning and prompting performance. So far, it's kind of orthogonal, which is, you know, if you want to get a better fine tuning model, you have to do something that will hurt prompting and, yeah. and vice versa. So figuring out like, is it just like, is it just because we don't have like, bi-directional like masks is that why is it because we only mask for like causal models and upper triangular matrix mm -hmm. is there something more fundamental there i think kind of peeling that apart and figuring out what's going on there is kind of important too um but i think we're very early on uh, i think multi i think this year is going to be the year of multimodal yeah i think Dolly kind of kick stuff off so i'm kind of excited to see what other groups are working on it seems um, like it yeah um, is there anything else about the paper or the research direction you want to shout out, you want people to know that we haven't mentioned so far? Yeah, I mean, we'll be releasing all this code really, really soon. Uh, we're just waiting on some internal approvals so people will get to play around with it. Um, I think we'll release the 3 billion model, but the 13 billion model is the one that really shines. Yeah. So if people can get that running, uh, I think it's really cool. I've spent hours just playing around with it. It's really nice. fun. What does it, uh, what does it take to... Like just to forward propagate, what's like the minimal configuration? Um, so with the recent deep speed stuff that was released for inference, I'm not really sure because I think they said that you can use one GPU for like a 6.7 billion model. Yeah. So if you do model parallelism, I think you need two GPUs. But if, um, like without that, just give us a ballpark, you know, what, 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 would, it, what would it be like forward propping through this model? Yeah. So, so one thing is you could do it on a CPU if you have a strong enough CPU. Yeah. Uh, but, but for for inference, I think what I used was four V one hundreds. Yeah, okay. model parallel. So uh, less than a node. Cool, excellent. Well, Armin, thank you so much for being here. This was really cool. Um, really valued the like also the kind of behind the scenes in insights we got here, and yeah. I hope to see you again very soon with even like CM four. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. Excellent.